Good morning. I want to welcome those that are in this auditorium. I want to welcome those in the lounge. Welcome those in the party room. Welcome those that are watching online. Can we all give God a hand clap of praise for saving us and getting us here today? Amen. 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 My name is Dale, and I'm the lead pastor of Stanley Chapel and Life Spring Church, and we're so excited that you came. We've been praying for you. We've been planning for you. I wrote this sermon for you, and it's always nice when you throw a party that people show up to it. You know what I'm saying? So look at the person beside of you and say, I'm glad you showed up today. Go ahead and look back. Yeah, that's good. Look at him do that. That's good. Now you look back at that person and say, I'm glad you showed up because you need to be in church. Go ahead and do that. Yeah, that's, they, need to, they need to hear that, right? Hey, I'm glad you're here, and if you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, I want you to uh, accept, this is not a members-only club, this is not, you don't have to believe like us to come to church here. We built this place for people like you. In fact, a lot of us pay money every week because we wanted to give a safe place for you to come and encounter the things of Christ and for you to find a, a relationship with Him. And we understand that just because we have found peace, just because we have found purpose, just because we have found this eternal uh, fulfillment does not mean everybody has. And so we wanted to build a place that would be a place where you could come and investigate the claims of Christ and hopefully at some point place your faith in Jesus and you'd find the same things that we found. So if you do that today, let me, let me know about it. Here's how you can let me know. If you look inside of your bulletin, there's a prayer card. You just check the appropriate box and on whatever auditorium you're in, as you exit, there's a black box on the wall. Place that in the black box and I'm going to get that card. I'm going to pray for you and, uh, and I want to be a part of your spiritual journey. So, so make sure you let me know. Now, I'll also, today is an exciting day because today is, um, is the week that we're kicking off our small groups for the fall semester. If you have not been, a, if you've not signed up for a small group, you need to sign up this time. We're doing a really cool study. It's very innovative. We're, uh, for us, we're doing a video study inside of our small groups by a guy named Francis Chan is the guy that's communicating and then we're going to discuss. But here's what I really like about it is we're studying the book of James. Now, not all the groups are doing the video thing. It depends on some technology issues, but mo a lot of them are and we're studying the book of James. Now why I like the book of James is because James is the younger brother of Jesus and he believed that Jesus was the son of God. Now if you've ever doubted if Jesus is the son of God, just think about that for a minute. His younger brother thought he was God. Does your younger brother think you're God? Point made, right? You got it, right? So that's a pretty imp impressive proof. And so he talks about some things about God, and he talks about he, he just uh, some really cool things. So you need to sign up today. There'll be a place right outside here. Make sure you sign up so you don't miss it. It starts this week. Pick the night that best suits you and, uh, or the time that best suits you, and, uh, and it's going to be an incredible, incredible study. Now, also today, we're beginning a new series called From the Heart. Say From the Heart. From the heart. Now, here you go. This, this study is coming from this book that I read several years ago by Andy Stanley called Enemies of the Heart. Now, um, if, if you don't have that book, I encourage you to get the book. You can, I think there's a few copies left in our corner store. You can download it from Amazon or iBooks or wherever. I encourage you to get this book and read along with me because I'm skipping a lot of stuff. This book, I read it probably about five to ten years ago, and uh, it changed my parenting. Now, this is not a book on parenting. But this is a book that will help you understand your child and help you coach your child into what I believe to be a positive adult better than any book I probably have ever read in my life for me, even books on parenting. So I encourage you, if you are a parent, if you're a coach, if you are a, 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 a manager, a leader, I encourage you to get this book for their sake, if not only for your sake, because you're going to also learn a lot about yourself. And I did the same. So we're going to talk about this book. This is where the series come from. I like to get the book, the series into a thought or to a sentence that kind of encapsulates what we're going to talk about. And so here it is ready. Go ahead and post it. It's a social media moment and you can tweet it and Snapchat it and Instagram it and whatever. Take a picture of your outline, take a picture of it on the screen. But, but here it is ready. It goes in your blank. If you open up your bulletin, you can, you can take notes as we go. Your words, thoughts, and actions. Say words, thoughts, and actions. Ready? One, two, three. Words, thoughts, and actions show who you are inside. Now see, we like to separate what we say from who we are. We like to separate what we do from who we are. We like to separate what we think from who we are, but it doesn't. It's, it, it, it's a translator. Your words, thoughts, and actions are actually translating what's, on in, what's going on inside. So therefore, and this is the summary of this whole series, ready? If you want to truly change, True change begins by working on the inside. It's not just changing the behavior. Something inside of you has to change. That's the reason sometimes, and you've probably seen people who are poor and broke, and they win the lottery, and they're still poor and broke. 
Seen somebody who's overweight and they get some pill or some surgery. And then a lot of times, because something inside of you has to change if you're going to have true change. Everybody got it? If you got it, say amen. Now, as we get into this, um, I was thinking about this whole deal, and I'm, I'm going to get into this passage that kind of, we're going to build this whole series around. And uh, as I think about that, I was thinking about my childhood, a lot, of, a, lot of, uh, a lot of things I can go back to and relate to my childhood. When I was growing up, I was from a really Christian home. Now, some of you won't. You didn't grow up in a Christian home, and I get that. I was from an overly Christian home. Anybody know what I'm talking about when I say overly Christian, you know, right? Where you had a drug problem, you were drugged from church to church to church. Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? If the doors were open, your parents thought you had to be there because they felt like if they could keep you in church, you wouldn't have time to sin. So I learned how to sin at church, <laughs> right? And in some churches from experts, come on, y'all been to that church, right? So I, I was from an overly Christian home. Now, here's one of the things I don't like about Christians, and I've not, I still struggle with this to this day. Christians are not allowed to use non-Christian cuss words. We have to come up with our own. Because, see, here's the deal. We're not allowed to use non-Christian curse words, but, see, there's times that you have to have a word to fit the situation. Come on, somebody. Don't, don't, leave, don't judge me. When you slam your thumb in the car door, you're not thinking, thank you, Lord, that my thumb kept that door from shutting all the way. If it, my thumb hadn't have been there, it could have been a tragedy. Thank, just thank you, Jesus. Now let's open the door and get my thumb out. No, you need something else, right? Because there's something else going on. And so we come up with words like, thank you, Jesus. And you really don't mean thank you, Jesus, right? You know, you mean, you don't mean dear God, and you don't really mean dear God, okay? And so we, we it's Christian cuss words. For instance, if you do something wrong to us, we'll say, bless your heart. We're not really blessing your heart, okay? <laughs> Come on, somebody. Know what I'm talking about right here, right? But see, you non-Christians, y'all get to use it all. I mean, you can just do whatever. In fact, you non-Christians are so awesome, y'all can invent, y'all have invented a cuss word without using words so that when you want to cuss somebody out, you can cuss them out and not even have to open your mouth because you know that is needed when you drive, so when you want to cuss somebody when you drive, you have a signal you can throw to them and you don't even have to open your mouth. <laughs> just say, I cuss you right now. You know, right? And you just put that middle finger and see, Christians, we can't do that. So here's what I do, right? I just say, I just give them the hand. <laughs> see, I don't even know what it means. <laughs> and they're like, hey, you know, wave them back, right? You know, and I'm like, I'm cussing you right now. You can't tell it. So here's what it worked in my household. I'm struggling to come up with these words to fit what's going on in my heart. And so I would come up with these words like darn. Can't use darn in my household because we're Christians. And darn sounds like the other word. I couldn't say heck. I couldn't say gosh because it sounded too much like God's name in vain. And so my parents could, listen, here's the way my parents, see, I thought I should be getting credit that I didn't say the real words. You know, I'm coming up with these other words. And mom and daddy were like, no, you can't even say a word that sounds like a cuss word. So here you go, just pause for a I could get in trouble for saying a word that won't even a cuss word, but it sounded like a cuss word. <laughs> Does that make any sense to you at all? Didn't to me either. But they weren't the only ones who did that. My parents were not the only ones who came up with this secondary law to help you from preventing a major law. There were some religious leaders in the Bible that did the exact same thing. Now, some of that's okay, and my parents were actually probably right in doing that because they were actually guarding my heart, and I didn't even know it at the time. So there's a thing about guardrails that keep you from going to other areas. There's a positive, but you can take that to an extreme. These religious leaders of the Bible time did exactly that. They were handed the Mosaic law, and and, by, and so they decided that in, to keep people from breaking the Mosaic law, they would come up with these, they called fencing. They would come up with these laws that would keep you from breaking one of God's laws. And by the time Jesus came on the scene and he was born in Bethlehem and began his ministry, there were over 500 of these laws that were in existence. They were called the tradition of the elders. And it's this whole book of laws they used to govern society by. And you could get in trouble, you could get pay fines, you could do whatever. If you broke one of these laws that was not even one of God's laws, but it was to keep you from breaking one of God's laws. For instance, one of God's laws was don't do commerce on the Sabbath. 
that you should not do some commerce on the Sabbath. So the, the, the way the Jewish leaders thought about it was, hey, the Pharisees, they were called Pharisees and scribes, and, and those, they, they, they would say, and, and Sadducees, they would say, hey, in, if we can't do commerce on the Sabbath, then let's come up with a law, and they put it in society, you can't touch money on the Sabbath. And the idea was, if you don't touch money, then you won't break one of God's laws. Now, that's, that's all fine and good, and it doesn't sound bad. The problem is, they thought their law about not handling money was just as important, and in some cases, more important, Jesus accused them of, being more important than God's law. And so, uh, the whole idea was that they, would, that, that they just took their law, and what intended to be a good thing became too much of a, uh, that there became too high a priority placed on it. Well, Jesus came along, and he would like pay no attention to the tradition of the elders. He would pay no attention to those 500 laws that they had in the book, over 500 laws. He only paid attention to God's laws, and that ticked them off. In fact, that was the thing that they used to refuriate that he was actually a spokesman from God. They didn't believe that he could have been from God if he didn't honor their laws. He would do things like eat on the Sabbath and pick his own corn off the stalk. And he would do things like heal people on the Sabbath. And, 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 and he would do things that just kind of constantly overturned their apple cart by breaking one of their 500 uh, fencing to keep you from breaking one of God's laws. And so they felt like that was not really, that was, that was evidence he couldn't have been from God. Now, what we're going to look at, this whole series is based on one of those stories that you need to understand. Matthew is actually recording it where Jesus is ticking off the Pharisees, these guys who come up with these laws, because he's not abiding by the tradition of the elders. And actually, the law that he's breaking is a law that I got in trouble for in my household, and, and my kids get in trouble for today in, in our household, because it's actually a rule in my mama's house, and it's actually a rule in my wife's house, and you may have gotten in trouble for it too. Ready? Watch this. Jesus got in trouble for not washing his hands before he eats. True story. You can't make this stuff up. How many of you have ever gotten in trouble for not washing your hands before you eat? Hold your hands up, right? Because your mama believed in that, right? I had a friend of mine, his mama, he, he got mad. She said, wash your hands before you eat. He said, all I ever hear about this house is germs and Jesus, and I ain't never seen either one of them. <laughs> <laughs> so Jesus didn't wash his hands. So here was the reason they had that. He said, why would they have a law like that? Because here was the reason that they had. They, the, the Jews believed, and the, the way it was, that you had to keep yourself ceremonially clean to, to be able to worship. So they were concerned that maybe you would touch something that would be ceremonially unclean, and then you would eat, and then by indirect contact, you would be putting something in your mouth that's unclean, and now you would defile yourself. And so they made this law that said when you, it's not just basic hygiene like your parents, like wash your hands before you eat. They, their law was you had to wash from the tip of your finger to your elbows before you ate. I have no idea why. I don't know if it's because if you, you know, eat from, like if you're eating, because maybe you eat like, like I eat, and you get it all over your arm, and you know, I don't know why, but anyway, anyway, you had to go from the tip of your elbow to, I mean, from the tip of your finger to your elbow whenever you, you had to wash the whole thing, and Jesus didn't do that, and, and it kind of ticked them off. Uh, but now, it wasn't required by the law to do that. It was just required not to be ceremonial and clean, but that was their law. So here's the way it goes down. Ready? Matthew 15, verses 1 through 3. Matthew's recording it. So then some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law came to Jesus from Jerusalem and asked, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? There it is, tradition of the elders. That, that's our laws, that's 500 laws. They don't wash their hands before they eat. To which I have to be like, really guys? You clearly need something to do with your life. Okay, can I just tell you something, ready? If you're in the presence of the man who can heal lepers, make blind see, feed 5,000 people, five loaves of bread and two fishes, calm the sea, who cares if he washes his hand before he eats? Come on, amen that. If you don't amen nothing else, right? That's a little petty. Can anybody say amen to that? I'm like, you need to get a job or something, right? Get some crossword puzzles. You need something. You got a problem. You've got too much time on your hands if this is your biggest issue. But here's the funny thing. Jesus didn't even answer this question, which is like what he does. Jesus replied, and why do you break the command of God? You're accusing me of breaking the command of the tradition of elders. You're breaking the command of God for the sake of your own tradition. And then he just launches into this little mini sermon, kind of a rant. And I'm telling you, he, accu he accuses them of breaking the command of God, not just the thing. And he says, listen, what you've done is you have elevated the tradition of the elders and you have devalued the command of God. And you, and he, he calls them hypocrites. It's brutal. He even says, he says, you have nullified the, watch this, this is very important. You have nullified the word of God for the sake of tradition. 
I ain't got time to preach this, but you know any churches that have nullified the Word of God for the sake of tradition? You know any Christian people who have nullified the Word of God because it's just running their family? It's brutal. So then once he just like, launches this attack to them, and they're all standing there like, Shazam, we just, you know, we just want you to wash your hands, dude. You know, right? I mean, it's just, he just goes, I'll judge Judy on them right there. You know, right? And, he, and, and, and then he turns to his disciples, those 12 over there, and they're probably over there high-fiving each other going, go Jesus, go Jesus. You know, they're just probably, they're, they're high-fiving, they're excited, they're all there. He says, wait a minute, before we go too far, I want to just talk about this for a minute, and I want to explain some things to you because I want you to understand why I just, did what I did and what this whole thing is about. I want you to understand the dynamic of this cleanliness deal that's going on that is behind the command of God. And here's what he said. He said, he turns to his disciples and said, don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? That's rich right there, ain't it? <laughs> you didn't know that was even in the Bible, did you? <laughs> That's the y'all read the Bible. That's some funny stuff in the Bible, you know. So here's what Jesus says. Don't you know that you're going to eat something, it's going to go down there, wallow around, make its way through that intestines, and then you're going to drop it like it's hot. <laughs> <laughs> See, you know, what tickles me too about this whole thing is I bet nobody else wrote that down but Matthew. You know what I'm saying? Everybody else is like, that's kind of gross. And Matthew's like, could you slow out Jesus? You know, right? He's a, he was a tax collector before he came to the Lord. He's like, could you slow down a little bit? You know, right? And the other guy's like, just move on, Jesus. That's kind of crude, right? Anyway, I just think it's funny. Y'all ought to read the Bible. There's some good stuff in the Bible. He, say, he goes on. He says, but the things that come out of a person's mouth come from the heart, and these defile them. In other words... God isn't nearly as concerned as what you put into your mouth as what's coming out of your mouth. In other words, what makes you nasty is not what you eat. What makes you nasty is what's in your heart. And see, I don't, you know... <laughs> I don't really like this part where he says that the things that come out of your mouth are f come from the heart. I, I, honestly, I want to push back on that. And if I was like, you know, somebody way smarter or whatever, I might would try to disagree with Jesus because, see, here's the thing. I want to say, really? Did you really mean that? Because, see, here's what I like to do. Come on, somebody. Y'all amen me. Don't, don't judge me. Today. No, this is a judgment-free zone. Can we say amen to that? Is that all right? I want to say that whenever I lose my temper and I say things in my family or I say things to people that I shouldn't, I want to come back to them and say, guys, I don't know where that come from. That's not in my heart. I don't really feel that way. Come on, have y'all ever said that or am I the only one? But Jesus, you know, we're like, I, honey, I'm sorry. I don't know where that came from. Jesus is like, I know where it came from. It came from inside of you. You see, you just didn't mean, to mean it to come out, but you know where it came from. You didn't intend to say it, but you know where it came from. Because that's what's going on inside. Because he says eventually everything in your heart gets translated into words, thoughts, and behaviors. In fact, look at what he says. He goes on. He don't just stop there and say what you say comes from the heart. He says, for out of the heart come evil thoughts to which I want to be like, no, 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 no. See, that comes out of my mind. I just thought those nasty thoughts came from my mind. I just thought that anger comes from my mind. I just thought that was, God's like, Jesus like, no, 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 no. It's not just in your mind. The reason your mind had those thoughts is a deeper issue. You, you can't just look at the mind. Looking at the mind only is like when there's a fire going on and you shooting the uh, extinguisher at the top of the flame. You've got to go deeper to the base. The base is not the mind. The base is what's going on in your where? Heart. He says, he says, it's for out of the heart that your thoughts come. And then he says, and this, listen, here's what happens with those thoughts. Those thoughts turn into actions. Because murder, you don't murder somebody unless you've thought about murdering them, which has now come from anger in the heart. 
Adultery, you don't commit adultery. You don't cheat on your spouse all of a sudden. And the behavior is like, I don't know where that came from. No, I'll tell you where it came from. It came from your thoughts when it came from your heart. You don't have adultery physically until you have had it mentally. Sexual immorality, you don't have sex with your boyfriend or girlfriend before marriage. But then all of a sudden, and you say, I don't know how that happened. No, it happened in your mind, which came from your heart. And he goes, right on, theft, no man has ever robbed any, a bank until he robbed it in his mind and his heart first. False testimony, slander, all those things. He says, listen, what is in your hearts gets translated to your words, gets translated to your thoughts, and eventually are going to come out in your actions. He said, these are what make you nasty. <laughs> these are what defile a person. But eating with unwashed hands does not defile them. Which was big news for the Jews because the Jews felt like that, hey, if you got to be careful, you know, he, see, Jesus said, listen, what, what, what makes you nasty is what you're, what's coming from your heart. It's not, it's not what's going in your mouth, which is big news for them because they felt like that, hey, if you eat certain things, it makes you nasty. And hey, if you, and I don't mean it's no disrespect for the Jews, but let me just say this up front. I don't ever want to join any religion that don't let me eat bacon. That's good preaching right there, somebody. Amen. So they felt like if they eat certain things, it makes them nasty. And Jesus says, it's not about what's going in your mouth that's making you nasty. What makes you nasty is what's coming out of your mouth. Because what's making you nasty is you've got a heart issue. <laughs> Everything that's going on stems from your heart. And so what we've got to do is we've got to learn to look at what's going on in our heart. We've got to monitor the things that are happening in our heart. Because if we could monitor what's going on in our heart, we would see a marked improvement in our behavior. But it stems from paying attention to what's going on in our heart. And nobody ever tells you. Now, in order for you to understand this, let's first of all understand what kind of heart he's talking about. He's not talking about the EKG and treadmill and the dye and things that they shoot. He's talking about this inner person that makes you what you are. He's talking about that heart that is invisible, that is inside of you, that represents your soul, mind, and spirit. He's talking about the heart that poems talk about. He's talking about the heart that Delilah at night's talking about, right? Come on, somebody, right? He's talking about the heart that philo philo philosophers are writing about he's talking about that heart that in ninth grade got broke when what's her name told you i just want to be friends <laughs> tramp you didn't even like her no way right <laughs> he's talking about that thing that swells with pride whenever your kid hits a home run he's talking about that thing that is inside of you that whenever your your wife says i still do baby i'd marry you all over again you just something tingly goes off inside y'all know what i'm talking about he's talking about that thing that gets all nostalgic and wants to yell when you hear shut through the heart and you're to blame darling you give love what y'all heathens y'all need to quit listening to that stuff <laughs> listen to more jesus music he's talking about that thing that swells up when you hear bon jovi songs right that's what he's talking about. He's talking about that thing inside of you that, that wants to wring that coach's neck when he won't put your kid in the game. But leave him on the bench the whole time. He's talking about that thing inside of you that wants to tell drivers one way to heaven with your one finger. You know what I'm saying? Dumb drivers, right? He's talking about that thing in you that likes to tell those racist jokes because you got that twinge of prejudice. He's talking about that thing. And he says, that is what enables, that, that mysterious part that enables you to laugh, enables you to love, enables you to be afraid, enables you to have courage. That is the realm, that heart is the realm where relationships are built and broken, where your heart grows cold in that relationship. Now, if that's the case, here's what this whole series is going to be about. We're going to ask, How's your heart? Not, not how are you doing, not say how's your career, not how's your family, not how's your finances, not how's your heart. And that's probably a hard question. You probably never stop to consider it, and you're probably sitting here like, I don't even know how to answer that. I get it. That's why we're going to spend five weeks talking about it. Because nobody's ever taught you to answer that. It's hard. It's easy to know how to monitor your behavior because we got a lot of people around us who will be helping us with our behavior. When my behavior's not right, my wife will let me know. Come on, somebody, y'all know what I'm talking about, right? When my behavior is not right, my boss will let me know. When my behavior is not right, my parents will let me know. But my heart, nobody's ever asked me to stop and notice my heart. And why would you stop and notice your heart? You got meals to fix, you got homework to get up, you got kids to get to school before you kill them <laughs> on time because you're going to be late for work. 
And I, I mean, you got all those things. You don't have time to worry about your heart. And no one's ever asked you to monitor your heart. What they've always told you to do is monitor your behavior. Because if we can monitor our behavior, we, you know, then things work out. Because we learn early on, bringing an apple to the teacher gives good brownie points. Being a bad boy in school does not. And so we've learned to shape our behavior to get what we want from our parents, to get what we want from our teacher, to get what we want from our spouse, to get what we want from our parents, from our, from our employers. We, we, we've learned to shape our behavior and all the time ignoring what's in our heart because we've never, no one's ever encouraged us to do that. It's just monitor your behavior. It's like the little boy in the shop, you know, in the shopping cart, and his mama was shopping, and the little boy kept standing up in the cart, and he stood up, and she said, "Sit down." And then she goes a little bit further shopping, getting groceries, and he stands up. She says, "Sit down." And then he, he goes a little bit further, and he stands up. She says, "I told you to sit down." About the fourth time he did that, she he stood up, and she said, "I've told you to sit down. If you stand up again, I'm going to spank your rear end." And he sat down, looked at his mama, and he said, "I might be sitting down on the outside, but inside I'm standing up." Okay, now here, here's it. That's cute and that's funny and, and I laughed too when I heard it. But it's not really all that funny, is it? What we're doing is we're just monitoring behavior. And don't get me wrong, I do the same thing for my kids. I told you this helps you in parenting. But it's looking a little deeper. What's going on inside that makes you not want to obey? No one's ever told you to do that. But the Bible tells us to do that over and over. Jesus wasn't the only one. A thousand years before Jesus said it, Solomon said it. He said, above all else. In other words, this is high priority in your life. If you don't get anything else right, get this. One, two, three. Say it out loud. One, two, three. Guard your heart. Why would we want to do that? Solomon, who's a very wise man. Here's why. Because for everything you do, everything, say everything, it flows from it. So he says, you, you need to pay attention to what's going on in your heart. He actually, that is a command. He commands you. And, it, and it's very hard, and it's actually a bit scary, because the truth of the matter is it's very hard to know what's going on in there because you can't always understand it. In fact, one prophet, Jeremiah, he kind of asked a rhetorical question. He, he's like, it's, it's so hard to guard your heart. He said, the heart's more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Look at the person beside of you and say, you sick. You sick. Don't you like coming to church? You just feel good about yourself when you leave, don't you? And then he asked this question, who can understand it? And the, and, and the implication is that nobody can understand it. And he's right. Nobody can understand it. And that's the reason we have to monitor it. We can't understand it because the truth is we're kind of sick. Come on. Let's just all get on the same page. No judgment zone. Who's ever had a sick thought hold your hands up good and high where you've thought about hurting somebody bad come on come on come on come on raise your hand jesus loves truth tellers so who can understand it you don't even know why you feel that way so it's kind of like a dormant volcano what you don't know can hurt you and you have to keep a, a monitor on a dormant volcano because if you're not careful one day it'll explode and some of you have suffered from a heart that exploded Suddenly, somebody files for a divorce. Where did that come from? I didn't even see it happening. It won't sudden. Suddenly, that kid's grades just, and the attitude just, what's wrong with them? Where did that, it must be their friends. Suddenly, some innocent pastime. Seems to have gotten control of you. And this seems to be controlling you, and you can't seem to get free from it no more. Um, suddenly, you and your wife have a spout, or you and your husband have a little disagreement, and, or you and your mom have a disagreement, and you just unleash, and it's almost like you're having an outer body experience. Like, why are these words coming out of my mouth? Or you're on the receiving end of that. I never knew they felt that way. It's like a dormant volcano. What you don't know can hurt you. Um, so what originates in the secret place will not remain secret, according to Jesus and the rest of the Bible. If it is in your heart, eventually, say eventually. eventually. It may not happen quickly. Eventually, it gets translated 
into words, thoughts, and deeds. And everything you do, everything you say, everything you're thinking is a translation of what's in your heart. And that's why you have to monitor it. And I'll give you a clue for the rest of the series. That's how you monitor it, is monitoring your thoughts, your words, and your deeds. Um, now, life is hard on the heart. And life is very difficult. The heart sensitivity slowly erodes. The older you get, I've learned. And that's why if you're not careful, the older you get, the more hard-hearted you will get. And um, you, get a, you can get some what I call spiritual heart damage. And um, it, it's hard to detect that. And if you're not careful, it'll stay there in you long enough that one day you'll wake up, watch this, and your heart is out of sync with God's heart. And it's not beating to the rhythms He intended your heart to breathe, beat on. And you now have become a little bit wicked and defiled and corrupt in heart. And here's why. There's many sources that it come from. Hearts are damaged by outside influences. Uh, there's things from the outside that come in and hurt us sometimes. Hurt and rejection are part of this world. Can anybody say amen to that? Uh, that's part of it. There's their unavoided re realities of life. I don't think there's nobody in this place who's not been hurt. How many of you have ever been hurt and rejected? Hold your hands up good and high if you've ever been hurt and rejected. So today I am a reject talking to a bunch of rejects. Okay, that's what we are today. Really? It's a reality of this world. And they, the problem is that stuff gets lodged in our heart. And especially when it happens very young. Because when things happen to us as children, it's pain that has to come into our life without a name. It's pain without a name and we don't know how to process it we don't have to give a name to it and we don't know how to articulate how we feel and so that stuff goes swirling around and somehow it gets lodged in our heart and long after you have lost weight you still feel fat because of those things that got and long after you have grown into your feet you still feel clumsy long after that acne has cleared up you still feel very unattractive and very very uh you got a lot of problems long after you learn what to do with that hair if you have hair and you learn how to handle it it still don't feel right and it never looks good enough and then and then and then those memories and those scars remain and I, i'm telling you I, I you know i don't think anybody gets through middle school without being having a little bit of dings put to their heart can anybody say amen to that they say sticks and stones may break my bones but words will never hurt me there has never been a bigger lie. I'm going to tell you, I broke bones and they heal a lot quicker than broken hearts. Come on, somebody, am I right? So what happens is we get this pain and we process it through our heart and, and then eventually it makes its way out. And so now what happens is you reach your adulthood and you're mad and you don't even know why you're mad. You're just a mad person. You just got anger all the time. You're discontent. It's like nothing you have yet. And you got, you got everything. You don't even know why you don't, you're not happy. You got a great family and a great stuff. And you're just, just miserable. You're, um, you, you, just, you just wake up one day and you're you know, resentful to people who hadn't even done anything to you. And you don't even know why you don't like them and resenting them. You don't even know what's going on. You're, you just wake up one day and you're jealous and you know how petty and immature that is. But it's there. And then sometimes the damage comes from inside of us. Not just outside of us, but inside of us. What I've learned after years of working with people is that a lot of times people have secrets of hidden sins and past mistakes and they never tell anybody. And that lays harbor in their heart. And sometimes, hey... Y'all, amen this if y'all have noticed. Sometimes we're our own worst enemy. Can anybody amen that? We're our own worst enemy. And so what happens is those secret sins that lay in our heart and those, those, um, those things that are in there, they start creating behaviors that really are, like for instance, you become very, uh, and, and I'm going to make some people right now very uncomfortable, and I apologize, but you need to wear it up front. I I'm, I'm I'm apologize for making you uncomfortable, but you need to hear it. Some of you are unjustifiably suspicious. You're very jealous, very suspicious of your spouse or your kid or whoever. You're just, you're just so suspicious. And here's what I have learned. Watch this. And this is going to hurt somebody's feelings. Most of the time that stems from a hidden sin. The thing you're most suspicious of are sins that you've had in your life and you've never come clean. So like if you're so scared somebody's going to cheat on you because you've cheated on somebody or you did in your heart or something's going, or you're so scared somebody's going to steal from you because you've done that somewhere. I've, I've learned that. 
When somebody's highly suspicious of other people, unusually suspicious of other people, there's no real evidence for it, but yet they just constantly are making this fabricated case, that's usually something going on inside that is damaging their heart. They need to come clean with some things. Or, or maybe inside, you, you, know, you don't really want to be known because of that secret sin that is there. And to you, to have close friends and to be known is equivalent to being found out and discovered, and you don't want to be discovered and found out. So you hide, and you don't let anybody get too close to you. And every now and again, somebody just loves you and they push through those walls and they try to get close and I would say to you if you're trying to get close to somebody who has secret sin and hidden secrets in their life beware because eventually they will push you away and make you feel like it's your fault because they will begin to unleash things through their words to say to you that will be very hurtful they will say the things that are always said to by someone who has a mouth connected to a wounded heart because hurting people hurt people. And then they in turn hurt people who hurt people. And it goes on from generation to generation to generation. Am I preaching all right? Do y'all see this? If so, say amen. I know it's uncomfortable for some of you right now, but it's the truth. Now, um, of, of us, uh, there, there's none of us adults who don't have pain in our life. And how we process that pain determines how we uh, determines how, how, we, how, much, how healthy our heart is. And some of you have never processed it well. In fact, you have just adopted it as normal. In fact, you just say things like, that's just the way I am. You've actually took this hard-heartedness and made it part of your personality, which is a little bit sick of its own, and you know that. And it don't have to be that way. Now, sometimes um, when you have a heart problem, you don't always know you got a heart problem. Um, sometimes it's not noticeable, the symptoms, and sometimes the symptoms are there and they're clear. It's like a flare on the night sky, but you don't know how to determine them um, and you don't know how to read them. So let me, let me tell you this way. Years ago, several years ago, um, I had some heart issues and uh, I had some issues that were going on in my health. I should say it that way. I had some health issues just several summers ago and it, and it became a problem. And uh, my wife kept telling me to go to the doctor and I told her to submit to her man and be quiet. You know what I'm saying, right? And so that went on for about six months until one day we, a tree had fallen in our horse pasture when the family project was cleaning up that tree and I was running a chainsaw and I had to sit down. I couldn't even make it to the house. Well, she, very unsubmissive, made an appointment for me to go to the doctor. Yeah, <laughs> some of you, amen. Yeah, no, no, no. And I'm being, for those who are new, I'm being sarcastic. Everybody knows I love my wife and that's, uh, that's, that's what she should have done because men can be hard-headed. Don't tell anybody I said that. That's just between us. Uh, don't amen that. So she made an appointment for me to go to the doctor. They did all these tests. I did the treadmill. I did the dye. I did the whole thing. Turns out it was high blood pressure and something about too many milkshakes, blah, 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 blah. But anyway, something like that. So, so it, I, I won't have a heart attack, but that was the way I think. And I learned a lot about heart attacks and heart issues during that time. And, and here's what I learned. I learned that you can have symptoms of heart attack that don't even feel like symptoms of a heart attack. For instance, here were some of the symptoms. Ready? This is what they, they said you could have. This is symptoms of, of heart issues, and you don't even know. I wouldn't think it is. Back pain. I've been born with, I mean, I got back disease. I, you know, back pain can be a symptom. Inability to sleep. I'm a pastor for crying out loud. We don't sleep. Anxiety. <clears throat> Loss of appetite. I, I've never had that one. <laughs> ever, ever in my life. Indigestion, which I've had all the time, you know, right? Nausea, vision change, where you, you know, so, so you got vision change, loss of memory. Now, see, here's the thing. You can go through and treat any one of those as isolated issues. So I could have these vision changes. I could go and say, hey, I need some glasses. They give me some glasses, and I treat the symptom of that problem. But if the problem, the real culprit, is the heart, then guess what? I didn't fix it. I just delayed it. Eventually, it's going to come back because I just topped the, the flame, just hit the flame, not the source of where the fire's coming from and so what happens is we treat the symptoms by grabbing grabbing my lanta in the middle of the night for the indigestion and there's a deeper issue going on the same thing's true spiritually some of you have been treating symptoms of your problem but you're ignoring the deeper issue because you've never heard this sermon you've never had this thought this is brand new stuff for you and so you're treating the top of the flame and not going deep enough to really figure. And that's why you keep repeating the same things. That's why you keep saying the same things. That's why you keep having the same problems. Because your problem might not even be drug addiction. It might be something deeper. And so you're treating symptoms and not treating the real culprit. 
And so, so here's some things that, that are symptoms that, that can tell you if, you if you're having some issues. Ready? Some symptoms of heart damage. Number one, guilt. Where everything that happens to you, you process it through, you know, <clears throat> reverting back to, to what's happened in your life. And, and, and everything in your life, everything that happens to you is about covering up and paying penance. Everything, everything in your life is about covering up and paying for the things that you've done wrong. And everything in your life turns out that way. You just, you just live with guilt and shame all the time. Here's another one. Ready? Symptom. Anger. You're just, you're just mad. And most of the time you can control it. But now there's an edge in your voice that's even scaring you. Um, you're, just, you're having those occasional outbursts. And it never happens in public. Watch this. It always happens with the people you love the most. When the filters come down. At home. Greed. You just have this sense of entitlement. You honestly, you've never articulated it this way, but you feel like that you've been cheated in life and you've never had as much as others. And you feel like you're owed something. You kind of have a scarce mentality, like you better save everything, hoard everything because, you know, one day it's going to all run out or, or you, have, you have a difficult time seeing this too. You don't want to share because you don't feel like you should share. You feel like rich people should share. You don't, you're not rich. You're poor. In fact, you are, somebody owes you something. You're entitled to something because you ain't had your fair share in life. Jealousy. Um, you ought to be happy for John and his promotion. And on the outside, you're like, hey, congratulations. You got that promotion. And inside, you brown noser. You ought to be happy. Your, your, your sister-in-law shows up wearing those jeans that you know you shouldn't cram your rear end in. You know what I'm saying, right? And you're, you know, and she's over there eating, you know, a lard biscuit with gravy and ice cream. And you're like, you want some? I got my carrots. I'm fine. You know, right? And you're over there. You, and, and you're trying to be happy. Like, oh, those jeans look good. But you ain't even acknowledging them jeans, you know? You're behaving and all, but you're not saying anything. You're not doing anything, but there's just something in your heart that is just, that is just not right. Here's the, ready. the next four weeks, we're going to talk about these. There's other symptoms. We're going to talk about these four because I think these are four that stem from a lot. And, and I'm going to talk a lot about this. But it, what's going to happen, here's what's going to happen over the next four weeks after today, four weeks. We're, we're going to like, you know, you ever going to like have a heart issue and they shoot dye in you to see like where the contrast are? We're going to shoot the, God's word in you. And that is going to be like his light is going to shine up and show the dark, dark spots, kind of like an x-ray, I guess, show the dark spots that may be tumors and masses that are growing inside of you that you didn't even know about. And that's the advantage of God's word. We're going to look at four life-blocking agencies that are interrupting you from having a healthy heart and have beat into the rhythm God wanted it to beat to. Now, here's the good news, is that damage, the damage can be fixed if you start treating the cause and not the symptom. If, you, if the man will quit reaching for the myelanta every time he has heart issues, I mean, um, indigestion issues, and go get the heart issues straightened out, then he won't need the myelanta. Here's the deal. We're going to look at the root, and the damage that you've experienced can be reversed by the name of Jesus Christ, because Jesus is going to set you free. Somebody say amen. He can heal the broken scars and hurts in your life. You're going to be free, but you're going to have to go to the root. It's kind of like this. Ready? Let's say you bought a house that had this massive, awesome pear tree in the backyard. And it was just, I mean, it was good pears, lots of pears, very productive. And, 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 and every time you go in the backyard, it's just a sea of pears, which normally wouldn't be a problem until, and it's kind of cool when you first move in. But then after you've been there a while, there's a sea of pears in your backyard. And then every time you go in the yard, it's on your shoes. And then you track it through your house. And then every time you go out there, it's just, the bugs and the, the, the stink and the, it's killing the grass and it's just a mess. It's just, and every time you mow the grass, I mean, it's like every time you mow the grass, those pears turn into supersonic scud missiles. You know what I'm saying? Hitting your car, your house, your neighbor's house, right? And, and so you're, you're just get tired of pears. What, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Um, there's, there's several things you can do. Here's what you want. If you, don't, if you don't want these pears in your yard, one thing you can do is grab a bucket, go out and pick up the pears and put them in the bucket and pick all of them up and then go pour them in the woods or pour them in the trash or pour them somewhere else in a ditch bank somewhere. And now, and now you got these rotten pears out of the way and now you can, you know, whatever, it, they're gone. But if you don't, 
if you don't want pears in your yard, that's not a permanent solution. That's a temporary solution. It didn't fix your problem. It just postponed it. And then later on, you got to get a bucket out again. You see, that's what some of you are doing right now with your symptoms. Those words, those behaviors, you're doing those things in your household. You're doing those things at work. And every time you come by with a big bucket, hey, I'm so sorry, honey, I promise. I'm so sorry, son. I'm so sorry, boss. I'm so sorry, best friend. I'm so sorry, mommy and daddy. I'm so sorry. I promise and I'm going to always and you can count on me. I'm never going to and forever I'm going to. And you pick those up. You, you dull out new. You dull out all these apologies. But here's the thing. As long as that pear tree is grow it in the backyard eventually it's going to drop more pears and it should because pear trees drop pears and you should see pears under pear tree you should see apples on the ground under an apple orchard if you walk under a pecan tree you're going to hear you're going to hear it crack under your feet you're going to know it because why the tree produces the fruit if you don't want the pear tree if you don't like the fruit littering up your backyard you got to go pull the tree up by its root. See, the same thing's true for you. You're, you're, you're going to have to quit pulling out your bucket. I'm so sorry. If you, if, and let's go to the root of what's growing this thing, that's producing this crop. If you're not liking the fruit in your backyard, cluttering up your backyard, you need to deal with that tree. It's time for you to quit dealing with the, listen to me, quit dealing with the fruit of your sin and start dealing with the root of your sin. And there's a big spiritual word for that. I don't have time to really go into it, but the big spiritual word for that is called sanctification. You can jot it down and research it, but it's where God don't just deal with the fruit of your sin, but your heart. Now, Here's, here's the deal. Ready? Here's the prayer I want you to pray. And this is where we're going to end right here this week. If you need to change from the inside out, here's a declaration that God made ge generations ago. Ready? He says, I want you to read it out loud with me. This is very, very important. Ready? And I will get, I want everybody to read it out loud because I want you to, listen, here's what I want you to do. Read this and I want you to pay attention. I want you to read this this week and pray this over your life. I want you to pray this over your kids. I want you to pray this over your husband. I want you to pray this over your wife. I want you to pray this over your mom and daddy. I want you to write this verse down. I want you to put it on an index card. Put it as a reminder on your phone. I want you to pray this verse this week. Everybody out loud. Ready? One, two, three. And I will give you a new heart, and I will put a new spirit in you. I will take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart. How many of you want that? Hold your hands up good night. You see, the interesting thing, God made that promise to people who already had the Ten Commandments. And evidently, behavior was not enough. Knowing how to act is not enough. Something's got to be behind that action. And it won't happen overnight. It's going to be a process. And we're going to talk about some processes to get you ready to be able to handle this. This during this series. But this is the prayer. This is what I'm praying that happens over the next five weeks. Today and four to follow. How many of you understand this message? Hold your hands up good and high. No head bowed, every eye wide open. How many of you would... You're making a commitment here because you know you need this, don't you? You know you need this. You've already seen it in your life. You know this is important. How many of you right now, eyes wide open, everybody, everybody looking around, will say, I'm going to be here for this series, and if I miss this, I'm going to try to listen online. I'm gonna, I need this. Hold your hands up good and high. Come and clean. Come and clean right now. That's good. Keep your hand up. Keep your hand up. Father, you see our hands raised to heaven. You see our commitments made to you. Help people in this room to not shrink back from their decisions, but to stand firm on it, stand strong on it, and honor it in the name of Jesus. You, you can put your hands down. How, how many of you would say, Dale, I've got some deep scars, and I know I do. And those scars are driving me absolutely crazy. They're dictating my life in a way that I, I can't even begin to articulate. I need healing. Would you raise your hand good and high if that's you? Just good and high. I need, your, I need healing. Hold your hands. Keep it up. If 
Father, for every hand raised, every hand raised, I pray that you'd help them get a handle on what's going on in their heart and heal them from the inside out in the name of Jesus. You, you can put your hand down. How many of you would say, Dale, I've had some people that have moved out of my life because my fruit has assaulted them. And I'm recognizing that today. Would you hold your hands up if that's you and say, Dale, I, I, I don't want that to just keep destroying my relationships. I see your hands. I see your hands. Father, I think our heart has stopped a lot of relationships. I pray that right now you would do a work of heart and help people right now to realize the price tag for this is high and the motivation for dealing with it is high. Use this for your glory in the name of Jesus. You can put your hands down. How many of you would say right now, Dale, um, honestly, I don't know that I've ever committed my life to Jesus. And I don't think my heart has ever been surrendered to Jesus. Or if it was, it's been a long time ago and I need to surrender my life to Jesus. If that's you, would you just hold your hands up good and high right now, if that's you. I see your hands, I see your hands, that's awesome, that's good, that's great. And here in the lounge, just hold your hands up, just keep them up and say, God, I am sorry for my sins, please forgive me. I wanna do life with you from this point forward. I wanna do life with you. Write my name in the book that you're gonna look at to decide who goes to heaven and who don't. And today, I give my life to you. Now, now right now, if you prayed that prayer, whether you raised your hand or not, if you prayed that prayer and you just feel like you committed your life to God, I want you to do me a do, do yourself a favor. You don't want to do this alone. You know you need help. Let me help you. Take your prayer card out right now. And you can give me whatever information you want to trust me with on the front. But check the box that says, I just began or re-began a relationship with God. Whichever one best describes your decision today. I, you don't want to do this alone. I want to help you. Let me help you. And as you go out, put that card in the box, in the a black box on the wall as you leave. And I promise you, I'll pray for you today. I'll get that card. I'll pray for you today. Please let me know. We're going to sing a song, and I'm going to have you stand in just a second. But I want to read something to you. This is by C.S. Lewis. And I just want this to bounce around in your head all week this week. He says, to love it all is to be vulnerable. Love anything and your heart will certainly be wrung and possibly broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give your heart to no one. Wrap it carefully with hobbies and little luxuries. Lock it up safe in the casket of your selfishness. But in that casket, it will change. It will not be broken. It will become unbreakable impenetrable and irredeemable. The only place outside of heaven where you can be perfectly safe from the dangers of love is hell. <laughs>